Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Lots to talk about this week, I, and, and I promised them we were going to talk about it this week. But first, lady in Missouri, first case of H5N1, the bird flu. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital. They checked her out for uh, flu, and they sent off the sample to the CDC, and it's H5N1. They have no idea why. There have been, uh, she had no exposure that we know of to, to cattle herds that were infected or poultry. But anyway, uh, so that's an interesting case. We have to keep, you know, we're always worried that H5N1 might break out. So, so far, all the cases in the United States have been associated with people who are in, working with contaminated cattle or poultry. Today, I want to start with TEFI, my favorite things. The, uh, they are looking at wastewater in Texas. And the reason why, this gives you a really great sort of snapshot of what's going on. Echo virus 11 and enterovirus uh, D68, still high. These are viruses that uh, cause uh, upper respiratory diseases. Echo 11 in, in particular is a problem with, it's an enterovirus that uh, can infect uh, pregnant women and, and infect babies, so it's, a, it's an issue there. Uh, Mpox is coming down in our community. Parvo is still high. We talked about Parvo 19, you know, uh, slap cheek disease. Kids come in with fever or, and they show up two weeks later with, the, with bright red cheeks. That's Parvo 19. The good news, flu and respiratory syncytial virus is not yet here. RSV disappeared. Flu is not here yet. And the good news is SARS-CoV-2 seems to be peaking and maybe finally at least not going up anymore. So let's talk a little bit about COVID because that's what... I, I know so many people have COVID. We had a, we had a faculty meeting and two out of three of them were home. I uh, was sick with COVID. A lot of parents are being exposed to it from their kids. So uh, first thing is, um, this is kind of good news, in the emergency room visits, they peak, they seem to be coming down, but they're still highest in the ages of 65, the 74, and 75. And those two groups that I mentioned last week still are high, uh, under the age of 1 and 12 to 17 years of age. So and I think that is reflected by what's going on in schools. Lots of schools are positive. Uh, the, the, so that's the emergency room visits. Hospitalizations, which is sort of a lagging indicator. People are really sick over the age of 65. That's not really in any other age group. And if you look at the wastewater analysis, I had said I was sure that it would get to the levels of JN1 last year. I was wrong again. Always wrong. But it got up to almost that level, and now it seems to be plateauing and maybe falling. So we may be lucky if, if, if SARS-CoV-2 begins to fall late in the fall, fall late in the fall, maybe we'll avoid uh, it disrupting like Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you never know. Uh, all over again, if you look at wastewater analysis, positive everywhere in the United States, which is interesting. And here, and this is important, 30 schools positive uh, in the independent school district in Harris County, two thirds of all schools positive in the wastewater. That means your children are going to be exposed to COVID when they go to school. No, there's no question about it. You are going to be exposed because of them. So the best thing to do is rush out and get them vaccinated and get yourself vaccinated. Get your whole family back. Make it a family thing. Get everybody vaccinated. Best way to, to make uh, to, to limit the damage. Uh, the, nothing has really changed in terms of the dominant variant. That is the KP3 variant. And I'm going to show you the slide I've showed about the relatedness every week because there's one new piece of data. So remember we talked about Omicron was, was what was positive, the highest uh, the dominant variant in 2022. We talked about BA286 coming from Denmark. And then one mutation became JN1, which was the dominant strain in 23. And now we have the flirt mutations, KP2, KP3. So KP3 is the dominant one. KP2 is the target for the mRNA vaccines. Why do I mention this? Because the new Novavax just came out. It is a monovalent, in other words, it's targeted to one antigen, to JN1. Now, JN1 was the dominant strain last year. I'm not, I, I don't know if it's because it's a little harder or takes longer to make a protein-based uh, vaccine than the mRNA vaccines, but that's to last year's version, not to this year's version. So I, I'm sure it'll be protective. But frankly, the mRNA vaccines this year are more closely aligned. So I would go with that unless you have some people have had trouble with the mRNA vaccines and do better with protein vaccines. So uh, but if you don't, I, I do the mRNA vaccine. Anyway, 
I mentioned the no vaccine. Uh, the good news is the flu season hasn't arrived yet. It's coming. It is always coming to a theater near you, but it will be here. But right now it's very low levels and the dominant uh, strains are the H3N2, H1N1, which are in the vaccine. So get your flu vaccine. If you want to put it off for a few weeks, you can. You know, flu season really peaks, uh, you know, November, December. So I got mine just because I went to the I went to the CBS and got my mRNA vaccine and my flu vaccine at the same time. And by the way, I was fine getting both at the same time. Now, I promised you more information on MPOX because it is a global health alert. The WHO had declared this a, a, a major health alert uh, this uh, late in the summer. There have been over uh, 27,000 suspected cases of clade 1 MPOX and 1,300 deaths in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The case fat fatality rate has been almost 5% with this clade 1, which I'm going to show you what that is. The clade 2 variety, which is different part of Africa, and what was, it, what was spread around the world in 2022 is much less pathogenic and it had a, a fatality rate under 1%, actually 0.1%. So clade one and clade two are different. Well, how are they different? They're, they are different viruses. They emerged, they evolved differently. Clade one is in Central Africa. Clade two is in West Africa, really mostly in Nigeria, but also in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, so West Africa. Uh, clade 1 is the one that is now of great concern, is many, many cases in the DRC and in some of the uh, closely uh, aligned, the closely neighboring countries. It is not spread beyond Africa except for two cases. One was a Swedish traveler who had just visited the, an affected country, and in 2022 there was a case of clade one in, in Thailand. It was also someone who had uh, recently visited one of those countries. So what's the history of MPOX? Uh, it's the first case that was identified was in 1970 in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, DRC. Uh, the symptoms are a fever, rash develops all over the body, hands, feet, chest, mouth, uh, can be in the, uh, near the genitals, fatigue, severe myalgia, and sometimes respiratory symptoms, sore throat, or nasal congestion. Uh, it likely spilled over from an animal reservoir, probably rodents in, uh, in that community. Uh, it is focused on Western and Central DRC, and children are very often infected. The, this has been on the rise for many, many years. So if you look at clade one, which is in the DRC, mostly in Central and West Africa, in the Western part of the country, there have been a couple of new cases that have cropped up in the eastern part of the country, which is a related clade one, but slightly different. So they evolved differently, but have just been identified in eastern part of DRC uh, in uh, Rwanda, Burundi, Uganda, and Kenya. So it, it's interesting. Uh, this was the were identified in, at first in 2023. This was uh, the first outbreak was in uh, Kamatuga, or 108 cases. 30% were related uh, to sex workers, so it's very uh, commonly sexually transmitted. And then in this uh, refugee camp near the city of Goma, right on the border of Rwanda, there was a large number of cases that was really from a refugee camp where they were very tightly packed, poor hygiene, not sexually transmitted, but just a lot of contact. And so that is the clade 1B. That's the one that is really spreading to the neighboring countries and is of great concern. We talked about the, the third part of this pandemic, of this epidemic. You know, there's clade one in central, clade one B in the eastern part of uh, that, of those countries. The third one is in West Africa. So clade two, that also comes from uh, animal reservoirs. The first identified in 2014 in Nigeria. Uh, it, it was actually started in 2014, wasn't really identified by the WHO as a problem until 2017. That clade uh, two is circulating still around the world. So far, 100,000 people in more than 100 countries have been affected. That is really what's the global outbreak in 2022. You know, that, that wasn't such a pathogenic disease and it kind of petered out. The clade one is much more uh, seriously illness, high mortality rate. That's the one everyone's concerned about. So the biggest question I've got is, I get all the time, well, why is this happening now? But it's real interesting. 
Remember, smallpox uh, was eliminated worldwide in 1980, and we stopped vaccinating against smallpox. Smallpox vaccine protects against mpox. And so the risk for people to get mpox, the age that we're, you're susceptible kept going up and up as people who would, you know, live, who had gotten vaccinated get older and older. So now there's a whole group of young people who have not, not been exposed. In addition to that, farming communities have penetrated farther and farther into the jungle, uh, in, into forested areas, and, you know, there's a lot more mobility. So if somebody gets the disease in a, in a rural community, but it goes to an urban environment and it spreads around the world. So that's really why uh, it is the, the, the lack of the resistance that we had from the original smallpox vaccine. Moderna has developed an RNA vaccine, so we're hopeful that that's going to be helpful. Uh, and we think that's what's going to be needed to be for these countries uh, to get it under control. We talked about Germany sending 100,000 uh, 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 vaccines that were intended for their military. We're sending a, a lot of money to help buy vaccines. That's what's needed. You need to vaccinate the susceptible population. And we have to think about it again. Uh, you know, should we be protecting and vaccinating people who are at risk? Probably should be, ought to be on everyone's, uh, you know, to-do list to think about what should we do for the, the future because MPOX is becoming more and more of a problem. I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, the Network of Practice in Health Science Scholarship, the Consortium of Baylor Texas Children's Hospital and the Baylor College of Medicine Children's Foundation in nine countries across Europe, Latin American has been awarded the 2024 Aspire to Excellence Award for International Collaboration. Uh, this really just recognized the tremendous amount of uh, international work that, the two, that we have been doing in, com uh, in collaboration with Texas Children's Hospital. I uh, also want to uh, congratulate Baylor Center for Space Medicine Translational Research Institute for Space Health, sent a series of human health research experiments on board the Polaris Dawn mission to space this week. Spaceflight represents unique challenges that we have been very much involved with, uh, trying to understand how uh, we can better uh, manage to live in weightless conditions. Uh, it also is actually useful for us to understand it under resourced communities, because there's probably no more under resourced area than uh, being out in space. Uh, we also uh, received uh, a, a grant for injury control research, Baylor and UT combined. Uh, received a, a large grant from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention for New Injured to Recontrol Research Center. So congratulations to De Jeff Temple, Associate Dean for Clinical Research at UT Health School of Behavioral Health Sciences, who's director of the center, and Dr. Christopher Greeley, Professor of Pediatrics at Baylor, who's the co-director. And then finally, uh, this week marked the 23rd anniversary of the September 11th attack on New York City, D.C. and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. In 2001, Congress designated September 11th of each year as Patriot Day and request the observation of September 11th as an annually recognized National Day of Service and Remembrance. I was in New York when that happened, and I'll never forget that, and we should all remember the people who perished and also the first responders who were really heroes uh, that day. So let's all remember them uh, on Patriot Day. Have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.